What is up, everybody? All right, we are live and we're good to go. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking about coffee competitions, coffee competition, blah, 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 coffee championships, uh, and just the different ones that are championships. Whoops! Uh, Let me turn off the sound on my phone. I have the chat pulled up there. Yikers! Um, so we we'll be talking about uh, a little bit of that. So. Uh, because I think there's a lot of, there's two different things going on. There's glorification of it on the one hand. And on the other hand, there is just a complete lack of knowledge as to what they are. Because it seems to be a pretty niche type thing. And people are you know, interested if whether they should be following trends that are shown in these competitions or whether or not they're helpful, whether or not, or just whatever they're doing. So today I figured I would go through some of the more popular ones, uh, talk about them, what you're expected to do in them, as well as just what... Uh, what they can give us as, you know, people who brew at home or people who are following the industry and following the trends and things like that. So that is what we will talk about today. Sorry, I just got done brewing a coffee. So there we go. All right. All right. So the big championships, the biggest one that most people know about, there've been two documentaries on it by a friend of mine named Rock. Um, call, uh, th that were called baristas. And then the second one's called, I think just barista, but, um, yeah, it's the barista championship. So you have, it's something like 40 some odd countries or 50 some odd countries, uh, have their own national championship. And then they send the winner of each respective country to a, wherever it's at each year, the world championship. And so they go and they'll compete to be the best barista in the world, quote unquote, obviously, it's not really judging who the best barista is. It's whoever has the the finances, the capability, the privilege in order to even compete in the first place. And those who tend to have the best resources often do the best. But anyway, what is the Brisa Championship? So Brisa Championship is a 15-minute presentation that you give in front of four sensory judges, a couple of tech judges, and a head judge. And so there's essentially seven judges that you're performing in front of some, around that. Um I guess it could change country to country because each country has the capability of doing their own kind of bylaws. But um, it, it will, I guess we'll go more with like worlds type stuff. But anyway, you get in front of them and you have a coffee or a couple of coffees prepared and you have to serve them. Each of the four uh, um, judges need to have a single shot of espresso. They each need to have their own milk based beverage. That can be whatever size you're wanting, but it needs to be milk based. And as of last year, it can be alternative milk. So a plant based beverage and it needs to be mixed with your espresso. And then uh, the third round is you need to do a signature beverage. So using that coffee that you're presenting and creating synergy with ingredients in order to create a, a whole new profile. So you have 15 minutes to kind of get across why that coffee is the one that you had to show them that day. That's a very important thing that they want to hear. It wasn't just some random coffee that was really good. You have a, an intrinsic connection to that coffee and you're presenting it to them that day in the way that you are because it's the only way it could be presented according to your preparation, essentially. So you have 15 minutes, you're showing all of this, and that is, in a nutshell, what the Brisa Championship is. Then, of course, you're graded in the or initial rounds, you're graded on your tech. So whether or not you're clean, if there are drips on your tray, whether there are any grounds that have fallen. So it's very anal and honestly a little ridiculous how anal it can be. If you're uh, if they think that your tamp is a little finger heavy or thumb heavy, that's why people have just gone to self-leveling tampers like the force tamper. Um, or the reason the OCD or NCD tool was created was because Sasha Sestic was uh, essentially it was a way of getting around those um, those those rules. They want to see distribution of the puck. And that was kind of a cheat way of getting it. And no one could really argue with you. So um, that way, once you're done with it, it's a flat bed and you get perfect points on that tech point of the score sheet. Uh, and so how much milk waste there is, how much of uh, if there's dribbles on your pitcher, things like that. So all those are uh, considered tech points. And then you have the tasting component, which is by the sensory judges. They're sitting there listening to you, giving you nice eye contact. They're judging your performance. Uh, the head judge is, is looking at your motions and they're tasting and seeing whether or not the notes, the flavor notes and the tactile notes that you give for the espresso matches their interpretation of your espresso. So it, 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 it and they're, they calibrate over a couple of days before the competition starts. And so I, the judges should be pretty well calibrated as far as the way that they dole out points. And 
they are calibrating backstage as well, or they should be uh, after the competition is over, just or after that routine is over. In case there are four judges, one gives a score of, let's say, a, a four, and the other ones all give sixes, they need to calibrate and see what the discrepancy was, and they may correct that score if they think it was, you know, way out of left field. Um, so there's a lot that goes on with these competitions. Um, so yeah, Barista is definitely the most famous one. And originally, the idea was to create an ambassador for the world, an ambassador of specialty coffee for the world. Now, whether or not it is still that is up for debate, I guess. I I am um, I think there's still potential that it could be that way. But what it has kind of turned into is, you know, just a fight to the finish, optimizing the score sheet. Now that the competition, the competition's been around since 2000. Now that it's been here for a while, it's, uh, you know, 24 years, 24th year of doing it, I guess, other than the COVID year. But um, there is, you know, this understanding amongst competitors that you can write your script, you can create your score sheet, you can figure out kind of the coffees or the flavor notes or the styles of coffees that score well, and you're essentially creating a presentation that optimizes the score sheet. So playing the game is what most people do. So is there innovation in the Brisa Championship? Yes, but they're in areas that might not be as necessarily helpful to the whole world of coffee as a whole. So what you have is one of the big innovations that came out in recent years was been put doing uh, the, the freeze distilled milk. But that's a very wasteful and time consuming process that is not realistic to to replicate in cafes unless you're willing to waste a lot of milk to freeze distill your milk. You know, you have um, shockingly, the first time WDT was ever used on stage was because of me. I had Andrea Allen in 2021 use it in Milan at the World Championship. And it was the first time WDT had ever been used on stage. Um, and then, of course, from that, you get like the auto comb and things like that have been created and competitors are using those because it's all about getting the best score uh, possible. So if you can optimize the, the, the score sheet, you're doing well, right? And so to give a little background, I, I have I have been, I was one of the coaches for Andrea when she ended up getting second in the world back in 2021. And then I was the, uh, I was Morgan's coach whenever Morgan uh, got second in the world in Melbourne a couple of years ago. Um, so I have a pretty decent understanding of what happens in those Brisa championships. And a lot of it, like I said, is you're trying to you're trying to align yourselves with the judges' palettes, with the judges' desires, and a lot of it comes down to what judging panel you have. There could be a judging panel that's optimized for your coffee, and there could be another one that's not. And if you get a judging panel that's not, you know, jiving with the style of coffee you bring, it could be, you know, lights out for you. And over the competition, they do swap out the judges in order to change up and vary the judging panels. And then, then in the finals, they kind of have a specific set that they use for the whole final six. So that's how it kind of goes. Is the in these championships, you have a big field, then it gets narrowed down to semifinalists, and then it gets narrowed down to the top six. And they go, so essentially three times um, throughout this process, they do their presentation. And the top six, you have one judging panel that just does all six, so it's as calibrated as possible. But leading up to that, you know, it's a crapshoot what judging panel you get because there's so many different judges. Um, so a lot of it seems to not necessarily be uh, based on straight up skill because you have a lot of a lot of variables in the air that you can't control. Another thing is you can have a massive team. There there are people competitors around the world that are working for roasteries or companies that have unlimited budgets and they can afford to I know some companies in the world that literally if they're if an employee of theirs wins the national championship so they're going to be competing in worlds, there are some companies I know of that will pay that employee full time just to practice every week, full time, 40 hours a week leading up to the match. Um, and so th there's definitely a huge skew on, I guess I would say fairness due to uh, the, the, the expenses of it. Right. And it, there, it's also a massive expenditure just to have the privilege of competing. Then you have to source all of your coffee, get all of your equipment. <clears throat> you have to have access to a good coach because mo nobody's doing this like on their own. And forgive me if someone out there has, but I've never been backstage where there was someone by themselves. They always have a team or a coach or um, people helping them taste and dial in and decide what to do. And so it's a very interesting competition because it is so driven by uh, uh, money. 
for the most part, you know, who can get the nicest coffees, who can get the nicest presentation. There are people who come out with these massive, exorbitant presentations. But if obviously if you're coming from, uh, you know, self-funded or you have a small company or you're in a country or somewhere that doesn't have a lot of those resources, you're, you know, you're kind of SOL. So it's, 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 um, it's not a perfect competition. And it's one that I'm conflicted about, to be honest with you, because uh, I want to see, I want to be optimistic that the intention is still to create an ambassador for specialty to the world, but it hasn't seemed like that in, in, in a while. Um, it, it just seems like winners going to take brand, brand deals and things like that. And I'm, uh, I, but I am hopeful. I'm hopeful that there's, there can be more of it. Um, you know, a great example of someone who became an ambassador to the world is James Hoffman, Daddy Hoff. He was a World Barista champion back in 2007 when tobacco was still <laughs> liable to be used in the competition. But, um, you know, it, 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 and I know that's a very special case, but uh, it, it, even still, it's uh, it's an interesting competition. So that's kind of what goes on with barista. Brewer's Cup is one that I... Uh, I have I've, I've competed in. Um, I've competed twice in Brewers Cup back in 2019 and 2020 um, in the U.S. I got third and second in those two attempts. And the way that Brewers Cup works is you have three century judges and a head judge. And with this, you're brewing three identical cups. You have to brew three separate drinks, three separate pour overs, or whatever you want to brew uh, of the same coffee to present to the judges. And then they you give them a presentation for 10 minutes. You walk them through their taste experience. And then essentially the bulk of your score is whether or not the notes that you propose them are what they get in the cup with this calibrated panel. Uh, there is a little bit of tech judging as well. It's not as intense as barista. They check that your pores are you know on time if they're hitting the right grams, things like that. But for the most part, they're looking at presentation and the, the flavor notes and whether or not you gave them all the information they needed, like where is this coffee from? What was the process? How was it processed? What um, is there? A, a, was there a specific reason you chose the roast profile you did? Why did you use that brewer? Things like that. As long as you tailor your script to the score sheet, you're good to go. Uh, the thing with bre brewers is there's a lot more reliance on the taste notes of the coffee. So whether or not you're aligned with the judges is a much bigger factor in Brewer's Cup because it's one cup of coffee and you're naming over 20 notes. You're naming you're naming uh, notes when it's hot, when it's warm, when it's cool. The aftertaste when it's hot, when it's warm, when it's cool. You're naming the body slash mouthfeel slash tactile. You're naming the acidity, the acidity level as it cools, what it's like acidity wise. You're naming, um, uh, you're talking about the balance and how it becomes balanced. And, you know, you're trying to use a flowery, you try to use flowery lingo to do that. Um, so there's a lot that kind of goes into the taste description in Brewer's Cup that's not as big of a deal in espresso or in barista. It's still a big deal in barista. It's just not as intense. There's not like a thousand notes you're naming. You're naming like three taste notes for espresso, a handful for the sig bev, a handful for the milk beverage. But anyway, so with this, you are graded. And then on top of that, you have a separate round called compulsory where you're given a random coffee. You have a set amount of time in order to dial that coffee in. And then you have 50, uh, you have about you know, 15 or so minutes in order to, or actually seven minutes, you have seven minutes to brew three cups of that coffee over 150 milliliters in each cup for it to be um, uh, judged. And so you have, it's a 45 minute clock. Typically it, it changes on how they do it. There's two different rules, I think, where it's like, you can either do 38 minutes and then the next day you have your seven minutes to actually brew the coffee or they'll do all in a row, 45 minutes, you have 38 minutes to practice and you have seven minutes to do all three of your brews within that seven minutes. But um, so though, so they kind of take those two scores together and then uh, just like in Barista, the top six move on to the finals. They do their open service again and whatever their compulsory was carries over to combine with their final open service. So uh, Brewer's Cup is, is an interesting one as well, because yet again, people who can afford coaches or can get a good team or have people who have experience are typically going to do better. And those who can get nicer coffees or um, have access to a lot of the science in order to make their presentation a little bit more robust or something like that is going to help quite a bit. This is something else that I have, you know, a good bit of experience in as well. I was coaching uh, Ken Hickman from Coffee Collective at Worlds last year. I've helped one of our own in Patreon, uh, Harris. Um, when I think two now regionals up in Norway, he's about to compete in nationals this week. Um, but a lot of it is just, you know, uh, knowing the score sheet. So when you create the script, you're writing it in a way that will optimize that score sheet. Um, 
Then you have something like Cup Tasters, which is the most objective, the only objective um, competition in these competitions. Uh, this one is they give you essentially eight sets of three cups or it's six sets. I can't remember uh, of three cups. And all three cups are very similar to or identical. And the third one might be it was roasted two degrees more. Or the third one might be the same coffee but slightly different process. Or the third might be, you know, something along those lines. And you're doing a triangulation where you're sipping all three with a spoon. Doop, 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 and you push forward the one you think is different. And you do that for eight sets or six sets. Again, I can't remember. And you're timed while doing it. And then you go on to the next round, then to the finals. And then whoever has the fastest time doing all the cups or the most cups is the winner there. So it's really the only objective one in the whole uh, in the whole competition. Uh, that one is obviously the easiest to explain because it's just triangulating coffees. And whoever can triangulate the best in the fastest time, bada bing, bada boom, you got the winner. Then you have roasters. The roaster championship is kind of unique. You get a green sample and you have uh, anywhere from like 30 minutes to an hour on a sample roaster they provide in order to dial it in. And then you have somewhere between 30 and an hour uh, on their production machine. And you are essentially with that sample roasting time, you're kind of figuring out the approach you want to take on roasting that coffee with smaller amounts. I think you get half a kilo. And then when you go to the production, you get a certain amount. I think it's six kilos of green and you get to figure out how you're wanting to uh, roast that coffee. And once you find your final curve, then you're going to submit a proposal as to how you're going to roast and why you're taking the curve that you're taking in order to accentuate the coffee's inherent qualities or traits. And then you have, you know, time on stage where you're roasting and that's how that goes. It's pretty truncated, but it's because roasting, it seems to change quite a bit. Um, so a lot of it deals with sponsorships and things like that. Same with latte art. Now there's a super automatic machine that's hosting it. So it's going to be a little different. I, I'm not, I haven't read the rules for this year, so I'm not sure exactly what's going on, but I know they have three rounds and you're doing different um, uh, under a time constraint. You're doing uh, different pours that you have submitted beforehand. You have to say, send in pictures of what you're going to do. And then you're, uh, you're recreating those pictures for the judges. There's an etching component and things like that. So um, a lot of it is, is a little bit weird as well, because, you know, for me, whenever it's something that's so unrealistic uh, in the real world, for me, I, it loses interest. And honestly, all, all these are for the most part unrealistic, but latte art, you know, no one's, unless you're at a super slow cafe and you're charging 20 bucks a latte to make ends meet, uh, you're not etching in a drink or taking four minutes to do a free pour dragon. Um and then you have, you know, you have the Ebrick Championship. You have, and I'm not sure on how the, that one goes because there was no Ebrick Championship in the USFC or, or however you pronounce it. Uh, apologies there. But um, you know, there's that one. There's Coffee and Good Spirits, which is essentially you're doing a routine, 10 to 15 minutes of cr uh, mixing coffee and cocktails. Uh, and you're presenting that to judges. So yes, it's boozy. And usually they have you do a, like, you pick your own coffee, you make your own SIGBEV. They like, I think they like give you a coffee and you make, you know, a spin on a, a classic with a specific spirit that you, that they provide, whoever's sponsoring it, things like that. Um, but yeah, the main things I wanted to talk about were barista and brewers, because those are the ones that get the most attention. Those are the ones where, um, you know, people really tune in to follow along what's going on. And that's where a lot of people tend to get their innovations, or that's where a lot of logical fallacies come in and say, yeah, well, I do this because the world champion did this. And um, that's what I want to talk about to give you a little bit of context as to what that actually means to be a world champion. I know for a fact, um, because I've met many of people who become champions of their countries or have done really well in the worlds that don't really know much at all about coffee. They are a good presenter and they were surrounded by a great team. And that is absolutely uh, doable. You can win without knowing much at all about coffee if you've got a strong team around you. And if you have someone choosing the coffee for you, which is not against rules, if you have someone dialing in the coffee for you during practice, that's not against the rules. If someone tells you how to dial it in with the grinder you're bringing, um, it's not against the rules. They can say, okay, put it on this number and dial until it hits 30 seconds with this much coffee out. You can do that. And so if someone has remarkable and I, someone, a friend of mine actually used to say that I, I won't name him because maybe he doesn't want it super public. But there was someone who would pretty openly say that he was not the best barista at their company. He was just the most charismatic. And so he would compete uh, because he was the best presenter for their team, because whenever a company, whenever a person wins, their company wins because then their company gets a lot of praise for producing a champion. Uh, and this is a very important, these are very important awards, um, you know, in the U.S., but outside the U.S., there's especially in certain parts of the world, this is like end game. This is the top of the world. You are a celebrity if you win. 
it's it's over. You have you you have a red carpet rolled out kind of thing. Um, and this has been shown, uh, you know, w- with, uh, for instance, Charles Babinski, who won in, I think, 2015. After he won, he got a whole cold brew canning line named after him with his face on it. And I think South Korea, and it still sells today. Um, things like that happen. The, one of the early ones, I think the 2009 winner, has a chain of cafes all throughout Asia and made quite a bit of money on it. Granted, times have changed a bit and that that, that kind of thing isn't really happening nearly as much anymore. But you still get people who tend to get a lot of opportunities from this, which is great. Um, but whether or not it's reflective of true innovation, whether or not it's reflective of uh, substantial change or new ways of looking at coffee or things like that, I would argue that that is more rare than it is common. Uh, Same in Brewer's Cup. You don't really have too much innovation going on. You have a lot of uh, theory and speculation. Uh, You have people, and and a lot of that is because in Brewer's Cup specifically, you have to give a reason for everything that you do or you get counted off, literally. So what I mean by that is if you... If you decide uh, while you're while you're testing your coffee, you find out, wow, uh, blooming, let's say this because this was not known a few, uh, you know, last year, or a few years ago. Let's say you're blooming your coffee, found out if I bloom it with 60 degree water uh, and then do the rest of the pour at 95, it tastes a lot better than if I did it all at 95. So you decide to make that change, but you have no no evidence as to why it's better. It just is, right? You cannot go, okay, my first pour is at 60 degrees and I'm doing this uh, and then I'm going to 95. You have to say why it is. So what you'll notice is, and even in my my two, if you go back and watch mine, I say some stuff that's complete pseudoscience. And it's because you have to give a reason. They don't care what the reason is. It can be complete garbage. It can have, it can make no sense. It doesn't matter. They just want a reason. And so you could say, I'm blooming it at 60 because it seems that it constricts the, the, the grounds in a way that holds back aroma until later. And that's why it's a more or aromatic cup. Obviously, that's not what's happening. We know what's happening based you know, with the Samo bloom. But that, that's, that's the thing is you watch it a lot of times. Or for instance, uh, and Tetsu knows this, but you know, when Tetsu did his famous 4-6 recipe, he was talking about how this first two pours control the... Um, like the, the the acidity, I think he said, and then the last three pours or the last 60% controls the bitterness or something along those lines. Uh, that is not how brewing works at all. That's just pseudoscience. It's not real. Uh, that's not how pour overs work. It's not how extraction works at all. And it was because he had to give something that was good for his presentation, something that uh, explained why he was doing what he was doing. And I'm sure that was the best way to brew his coffee because he won, he did a great job. But watching it and trying to derive truth from the competitions is not an easy thing to do because competitors have the onus of giving a reason for everything, regardless of there being actual evidence for what they're doing in, in some sort of scientific basis. Okay. So now that that's across, um, it does seem to be a trend now that people are using more and more processed coffees. And, and now, now that co- co-fermented and infused coffees are allowed, um, there are more and more people going towards that direction, which sadly seems to set some sort of trend in the in the higher, I guess, the higher echelon market of coffee. And so a lot of producers, it's a big thing if their coffee is used in a competition. And so a lot of people will try to replicate whatever is winning in order to get that kind of uh, publicity, which is absolutely like understandable, obviously. I mean, you go, you know, do it. Um, but it is a sad thing that that is what drives a lot of these higher priced coffees is the trends that are going on in these competitions. And a lot of it is because you are reliant on being calibrated with the judges. If you can have an infused coffee that objectively tastes like orange because it was co-fermented with oranges, guess what? You're likely going to get that point. And if you don't, well, it's pretty daggum provable that it tastes like orange, right? Literally was co-fermented with orange. And so that uh, that's a big reason why a lot of these um, coffees being used nowadays are so heavily processed is because the flavor notes are in your face and they're easier to call and get at least a baseline of them, right? And if so if you have like a super intensely anaerobic style coffee that is in, let's say in Ethiopia, because we know that with naturals, they tend to be very berry. So let's say you have like this insane, like 140 hour anaerobic, whatever, 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 uh, Ethiopia coffee, then you know that purple, like the color purple is likely, I mean, that's what people are going to taste when they taste that coffee. So you start with the most obvious flavor. You say, this is a very plum type flavor. And then because psychology is at play, anytime you say something related to purple, they're likely going to agree it's there because hello, no one can escape simple psychology. It's it's an impossibility. You're completely biased after you have a smell that's pretty objectively purple. 
then everything purple sounds good if it's presented in a way that's that's you know sly. Um, and there, you know, there are people who Todd Todd. Um, oh my goodness, I'm blanking on his last name. Todd uh, from Clatch Coffee. He, uh, you know, uh, years back, he used a specific, I think it was blue. He used blue mugs in his uh, world competition <clears throat> because there was psychological, there was, you know, proof, scientific proof that there was um, a s different type of perception people had when drinking from a blue mug. It like heightened some sort of taste or accentuated a taste uh, whenever someone was exposed to that color during the ingestion of a product. And so he used blue color in order to further manipulate the taste experience of the judges, which is completely legal. There's no point, like, why wouldn't it be? You do that in culinary events all the time. You know, people played it in certain ways to affect your experience. So there are a lot of things going on in these competitions that require not just forethought, but access to research, understanding of the competition, access to high quality coffee, to a coaching team, to uh, people to help you do dishes while you're doing run-throughs, yada, yada, yada. And so it's a pretty... It's, it's interesting. We'll say that. Now, there is uh, other competitions I was going to briefly discuss, and that would be uh, what I think is the most interesting competition, which is Coffee Masters. Coffee Masters is a competition that's not related to these world coffee events. You kind of have in the competition world, the most respected globally would be world coffee events. That's what James won was the World Barista Championship. Um, so that's the world coffee events. And so they have the coffee and good spirits, roasters, cuppers, all these, all these things, brewers cup, that's world coffee events. Then you have, you know, separate organizations doing their own competitions. So coffee masters is a very cool competition where the full spectrum of the barista skill is actually criticized under magnifying glass. So there's like eight skills or something that you're, uh, you're tested to prove. Um, and it's what a barista is expected to know if they're a total barista, right? And so one thing is the one thing you can really prepare for is you you prepare a signature beverage while you're at home or in order to that's how you submit is with a signature beverage. You create a video about it, submit it, talking about how it you know enhances the flavor of the coffee, yada yada yada. So you have that as one of the levels, but some of the cool rounds in coffee masters that makes it definitely a good barometer of a barista's skill is they have a cupping round where you're, and this actually, I have a lot of issues with this because processing has come so far, but they have a match the origin cupping round. So you cut coffees and you say which origin it's from, kind of like in a small EA contest. Issue is coffee is a lot more complex than wine, objectively, when you look at volatile organic compounds. And so that's a lot more difficult, especially now, especially nowadays with more advancements in processing techniques. It's very difficult. You cannot just encapsulate a country by a type of weight of the coffee or feeling or taste or aroma. Uh, so that's actually nigh on impossible. So if people do well at that, I wouldn't necessarily chalk it up to skill, but maybe to luck for that day. But the things that are skillful is from that cupping, you choose a coffee to present as a pour over or a filter coffee. And on the fly, you have to present a routine, why you're brewing it, the way you're brewing it, and what they're going to taste. And you have minimal time to prepare for it. You don't go home. This is all in the same weekend of the coffee masters. You get, you choose that coffee from the cupping round and you're like, all right, I'm presenting this. And then you do the same with espresso. You choose two or three coffees from the espresso round. You make a blend, what you what you think will be a good blend to serve. And then you make a presentation on it. Uh, you have a latte art round and they have latte art dice and you're rolling the dice and seeing you're going head to head against someone else to do some latte art, which you know, I don't necessarily think is a necessary skill of a barista to be that good at latte art, but it is, you know, this is testing the, the, tops. It's testing the tops of each of these fields. So I guess it's okay to include that. Um, and you have some other rounds that, you know, really test your skill set with all of this. So I think that's a really interesting competition and the winner is compensated quite nicely. Um, it's more in the form of a monetary uh, reward. There's usually a sponsor where you get, um, usually it's like five or $10,000. And then you get like, like I know Slayer one time sponsored and gave away a Slayer espresso machine to the winner and things like that. With SEA, you get some winning money. It's not substantial, but the big thing from that is, um, especially if you win barista is you'll get a lot of companies that are going to want to partner with you. Like for instance, Borom who won the world barista championship is now an ambassador for Mazer. Um, so things like that come to the winners because they want to have the face of, you know, Brisa champion, world, world champion, um, with their company for marketing, obviously doesn't really happen with coffee masters. Cause it's not really gotten the same clout. Obviously it's only been around a few years, 
but um, I do think it's a really noteworthy competition. You also have the World Air Press competition. This one to me is more of a you know a drop in the hat who's going to win. It's not as it's not nearly as intense of a process as uh, when it comes to tasting and judging as something like the World Brewers Cup, for instance. They have days of calibration to ensure that their judges are as calibrated as possible. Um, it, it's not as much like that with AirPress. And I've actually judged one and there was no calibration at all. Not a world's one, but I did do a national one. There was no calibration. You just went up and chose your favorite AirPress. So I think it's, I think if, if it was to be like a super serious, oh, this is the World AirPress champion and they are the best at AirPress, it should be a little bit, there should probably be more, more tests than just like, okay, brew. Okay. Next round brew. And you're going head to head there. I think there's probably different ways to kind of see who's the best with an air press than kind of limiting what all they can do and how they should brew it. But um, there is that. And then you also have the barista league, which is the coolest of all the competitions. It was started by Steve Maloney a few years ago, and it was an attempt at, he used to compete in the world coffee events, but it was an attempt at making competition uh, free for baristas because most cannot afford to compete or they don't have a company that will support them. And so he goes around like traveling and gets sponsorships. I thought that's how they make their money and uh, puts on competitions and the winners get to go on a cool origin trip or something along those lines. Um, I've competed in some of those. Um, I competed in Kansas City back in like 2018, I think, and got second with Alika Lifty at Onyx. Uh, it was a really fun competition where you cut, um, they would take bowls and they would put uh, infusions in it, like barely any, so that there, you would taste and you would say what the infusion was. It's objective, right? It's not coffee. It's water with maybe a drop of some sort of infusion. And then to mess with your head, they would put food coloring in it. That's a, it might be the same color as the taste or a completely different color. Um, I know there was one cup when I competed and it was peach, but they colored it blue and not a single person got it right except me. <laughs> but uh, that's what they do. They like to mess with your head uh, by doing these type of skill-based things. You have like, there's no preparation for it. You don't know what the events are going to be. So it's a really cool competition. But again, it's not something as serious as the World Coffee events. But anyway, um, I'm going to go to the chat now because I think I sufficiently described each of them, at least to, to where you can have a basic understanding, as well as maybe a couple of more steps into understanding uh, on you know what's required in order to compete, how the winners um uh, are, are chosen, wh whether or not the innovations are worthwhile, you know, whether or not, you know, oh, that person, the world champion used an OCD, so I should use it. No, they used it for points, right? Um, and the other thing is, is you might say, well, they need a good extraction to win, right? Not necessarily. The coffees these competitors are using are so insanely soluble. Most of them are pulling really quick shots. So the grounds are a bit coarser. Distribution doesn't matter as much because how intense the coffees are. If you've never had a coffee that costs like a hundred bucks for a 10 ounce bag or a 280 gram bag, um, you're, you've probably never brewed something quite like what they're using, uh, at least for the most part in the world championships, because they're using these crazy processed coffees that have massive pores on them. They extract really easily. You're grinding super coarsely. Um, it's, it's, it's like that. Uh, really short shots to make the acidity in your face so that's easier to call the tasting notes. You never see big shots in competitions. You never see one to three ratios, one to four ratios. Uh, I think the last time something that big happened was Matt Perger when he did coffee shots. Um, and that wasn't, yeah, so anyway. Okay, now we'll get to, ugh, my chat hasn't been uploading on my phone. I have to reopen it real quick. I hate when that happens. Ugh. YouTube. Open this the private link, visit site. Don't give me a Timu freaking ad. Golly. Okay. Yes, two documentaries. One, I think I think they're called Baristas first, and then Barista is the second, maybe. That could be wrong. But look up, the director's name is Rock, and his last name starts with a B. I can't remember his last name. Uh, they're really good, though. The first one follows um, Charles Babinski and... Um, Eden Marie and Charlie something and the guy that started Truman and, uh, and Truman who started Hopper and Burr. Um, it follows them to the U S barista championship. It's a cool one. And then the second one is following baristas to the world championship. So not just U S and they follow Kyle Ramage from the U S they follow Mickey from Japan. They follow um, Chloe from Germany and they follow Oh, some someone from Ireland. I can't remember his name, um, but they're cool. 
So yeah, single shots. Um, what gramage? So there is an amount that you're supposed to serve in each cup. I think it's fifteen grams. I think it's fifteen grams. Um, do the growers get much recognition? It depends on the presenter. Uh, so whether or not the growers get a lot of recognition really depends on the presenter. Some will present the coffee and will focus on the process. Um, and honestly, they, it, it nowadays, because the process is so much of the coffee, they are focusing a lot on the ingenuity of the producer. But most of the time it is like the producer, um, not talking about anyone else. Um, and, and we're talking about the process and the, uh, you know, how it gave the cup its qualities, right? Um, which is also another interesting thing because I've seen people spike their coffees with other coffees and not disclose it. So when Eugenoides got really big, uh, it's a very sweet coffee if you've ever had it. Very, very sweet, like artificially sweet. It tastes like fake sugar. Um, this coffee uh, is, is a is not this. It's a different species altogether than Arabica. It is one of the parents of Arabica. Arabica and kind of for a robusta came together, had a baby. Uh, I'm sorry, Eugenoides and Robusta came together, had a baby, and it was Arabica. So um, so you can kind of see Robusta has like twice the content, not really, but rough around twice the content of Arabica. Eugenoides has like half. They come together, boom, you have Arabica's content. But Eugenoides is super sweet, very low caffeine, um, like 40% of the caffeine of Arabica. Uh, but like I said, it's very sweet. And I knew, I know, I know of mo many competitors who spiked their coffee in Brewer's Cup with Eugenoides to increase the sweetness but then they would attribute the sweetness in the final cup to the processing or to the producer, uh, which is pretty disingenuous in my opinion. But um, when, when, when the, when winning can give you what it potentially does, you know, people are going to, they're going to play, play ball. I didn't know there were three drinks. Interesting approach. Yeah. Three drinks uh, in barista. You have espresso, milk base, and SIGBEV. In qualifiers, often they will not require all three. So if you're qualifying in order to compete at nationals in whatever country you're in, there is only two rounds, at least in the U.S. And it is usually just uh, espresso and um, milk, milk beverage, or is it signature beverage? I can't remember. It's espresso and one of the other two, and it's only 10 minutes. And then for nationals, you tend to do all three. But yeah, three, three different beverages. Sounds a bit more flashy show than what home breezes could use. Absolutely. But there has been, uh, a, I mean, people all the time try to borrow what they see in these competitions to use at home, uh, whether it's how they're distributing their coffee or the recipes. They'll go, oh, the Brewer's Cup competitor used this recipe. I'm going to replicate it. Oh, it's the best. When in reality, I mean, there's confirmation bias there because a champion used it, but they dialed in their coffee to extract in a very specific way in order to highlight it to get the most points as possible. So it's likely not going to replicate very well on your coffee. <clears throat> Making it sound like Eurovision, but for coffee, honestly, it kind of is. Most gimmicky thing you've seen a competitor do. There's a lot of gimmicky things that competitors do. I mean, a lot of gimmicky things. I don't want to like name one though, because I don't want to call out any specific competitor in, in a gimmick. Like the main ones in my head, I mean, it's very obvious who did it. And if they were to watch it, I don't want to, I don't want it to be a call out, but there are some really gimmicky things. Um, well, like sometimes people will um, do something weird for an ingredient and they will bring whatever machine that they used on stage just to show, like, I know how to use this, but they don't use it on stage. It's just like as a showpiece and it might be a, a big thing. I don't know, but that that's something that happens pretty often. Um, so that one I feel comfortable talking about, even though it's not the biggest gimmick, but it's like, Okay, flex, flex clean. All right. Um, what do you think will be the greatest effects of the SEA embracing super automatic machines? Uh, well, so they're doing it for latte art. And honestly, latte art has its own very intense subculture um, that I've been at the receiving end of <laughs> uh, because I have never really been interested in that type of latte art. I don't think it's, personally, I don't think it's really... Um, interesting because it's not really something you do in a cafe unless you want to hold the line up um, and serve a bad cup because in order in case you're you know not not um, don't know this in order to get those kind of like that foam that won't separate whenever you're doing the animal pours you have to steam it colder uh, and so it's not really a serviceable drink anyway unless someone wants like room temp milk 
that it's because the hotter you go, that foam will separate into the crema. You also need like a super dark shot and typically people will pull ristretto style shots in order to make it even thicker. Um, and that's just, that's not going to taste good. Um, and, but on top of that, it takes like three minutes for someone to sit there and draw because they're spending a lot of time slowly pouring the base of milk. Cause what they're doing, they're pouring it slowly so that the liquid goes in, but the foam mostly stays in the pitcher. So by the end, they're just kind of painting with, with foam. Right. So I, I, you know, when it comes to that, obviously I, I am not a, a fan that they're using a super automatic. I don't think it's going to at least won't it really, the price is right. That is what you should take away from it is I don't think that this as a precedent will start anything as far as decisions that would have already been made, even if this wasn't made, if that makes sense. I think that the more money people are going to be willing to shell out, the more we're going to see super autos as sponsors because they're going to take the money. Um, yeah. And James, actually, James Hoffman, uh, I think he has addressed this at least to some extent, because he used to be on like on a committee that would look at the sponsorships for competition. He was like on some sort of competition committee. And um, I can't remember what all he was saying, but it was an interesting, it was an interesting. Oh, it's on Emily's. Emily Bryant made a video about it and he made a lengthy comment. You should go check that out. Um, I always uh, wondered about the logic behind the four six. I thought he did comparative tasting to find which part does what. He may have done a comparative tasting, but even that is not scientific, and we know that it's that's not how it extracts. Um, and so, like that's like saying I did a comparative tasting between, um, I don't know, uh, doing a one pour and a two pour, and saying yeah, when I did one pour, uh, it was more acidic. Therefore, if you do one pour, you'll always have an acidic brew. But that's not how it works, right? So saying that this pouring structure will give you this for every coffee is just not scientifically accurate. It may have, for him and his perception and what he was wanting to go for, that's the other thing is, again, you have to take into account psychology. A lot of times people will begin a poor structure, a poor recipe, and they're thinking, what is the best way to market this? What's the best way to make this uh, engaging? What's the best way to, uh, you know, ensure my score goes up? And if you have a really captivating performance, you get a really good customer service score. And so it's really it like I would always top out my customer service scores when I competed because I gave a reason for everything. If you can give a reason for everything, they will dote on you and love it. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 the four six, it's, that's, not, that's not how coffee extracts. Uh, acidity keeps coming out throughout the whole thing. Uh, bitterness, um, yes, you can have more perceived bitterness near the end. But that, or, or, I think he says something about strength, not bitterness. He says strength and acidity or something like that. But that's, again, that's just not how it works. Um, but it doesn't matter because all they're looking for is a reason. It doesn't have to be a right reason. What's the reason? If you think that's the reason, if you if that's what you're going to present, they're not going to question it. Would you reckon, uh, let's see. Um, small local air press competitions feel the most attainable for home enthusiasts. Yes, but they're, like I said, they're kind of a crapshoot. And it's because most of the time the judges are not very accredited. They don't have any calibration. They're just like people who think it'd be fun. A lot of times they're getting drunk. Um, it, it's just like, they're fun, but don't go in and think that the best is going to win because it rarely happens that way. And honestly, you and it's not because the best doesn't win. It's because you don't know if they're the best. Just because they won with a specific coffee that was chosen and they have no idea what it is. It may be a coffee they brew all the time or a similar coffee. So they have a leg up, right? That's why I'm saying with all these things, there's no such thing as the best of this because it's so, it's so varied and vast. Curious about single shots. Are they using single shot baskets? No, they're doing double shots, but they're doing two porta filters with double shots and they have split shots on them. So you put four cups, two double shots, pull them, serve them like that. How can I try a $200 coffee? Is this something I should attempt at home or do I need to find a specialty cafe? I don't think any cafes near me have that expensive of beans. Well, to try it, you'd, you'd have to be in a very, like in a big city, first of all, to ever have a chance of trying it without just committing to a bag. Um, because most cafes won't serve that because it'd be like a $15 espresso. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can order some online if you want to bite the bullet and do that. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to because I don't think, I'm very confident you're not going to, you're going to try that coffee and go, I wasted money. Hey, yeah, it's good. But uh, 20, like 10, $20 bags would be a lot better. You know what I mean? So like the way that the pricing on those coffees go is very pejorative. It doesn't make any sense. Nice. Makes me want to taste um, eugenoides now. 
Uh, is it easy to find for us simple mortals? No, it is not easy for anyone. Not not simple mortals, not for uh, elites. It's not easy because there's currently only one farm selling it in the whole world. It was rediscovered on this farm, uh, 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 supposedly, um, resurrected on this farm. Uh, it's been said that cherries have been stolen and uh, other farms in Colombia have been planting it. But um, it's just from uh, Inmaculada. Uh, and honestly, I think Onyx, where I work, we get we get a pretty hefty share of of that. And so we have eugenoides that we release randomly um, in small uh, amounts. Um, so there are like an Ona gets a pretty bulk share of the eugenoides, but uh, it's very small amount that they produce every year. And it's one farm. So, no, it's no one can get it easily. That's not it. You have to just like pay attention to when these roasters who might have it might release it. Um, has someone competitively used half and half or heavy whipping cream? So you can't, you're not, I don't think you're supposed to use something that have fat, fat content. Um, uh, but maybe that's not true. I know that people do freeze distilled though. Um, I think that heavy whip or, or half and half would really kill your espresso. That's the issue is espresso still has to be the dominating taste in the beverage with that much fat. You would leave a thick film of oil on that on the fat on that tongue of the judges. And I don't think it'd go over well. Um, why, in your opinion, between flat drippers are more used slash your brewer's cup than conical? What are advantages for them and for competitors? Honestly, I think it's trends, right? Oria is a very trendy brewer. The origami is a very trendy brewer. Um, and so people tend to use things that are really trendy. Um, the 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 MK dripper is very trendy. And honestly, the MK has been turned into a, pretty much a conical at this point with how much uh, uh, um, release it has at the base. But I mean, it still has a different bed geometry, but you get my point. Um, I think a lot of that's to tame the acidity because they're brewing it with such coarse grounds and low temperature that you can maybe have uh, um, kind of ridiculous acidity in it. And so it kind of tames the acidity a bit. But honestly, they're just like, you can brew a cup that would win with their coffees on most brewers, not because the coffee is great, but because it's easy to call the notes. That's the number one thing when choosing a coffee for comp. You don't even have to like it. If it's something you can call the notes for, use it. Um, how to train to recognize flavor notes to present to Calibre Head judges. There's no way to train for it. You just have to go to a lot of competitions, be involved in it, and see how people score. That's the only way I've been able to do it is years and years of, of going to competitions, tasting coffees and seeing score sheets. Uh, Proud Mary has some pretty expensive pour overs. Yeah, they do. But I wasn't wowed. Exactly. Yeah, you're not. I've never had a coffee where I was like, oh, yeah, that was 200 bucks a pound. That right there was worth 400 a kilo. No question. That's never happened. Um any plans for San Remo X1 grinder review to fully showcase its bean feeding system? I don't know. Those things are expensive as heck. As heck. They tried to rope me in to help them um uh on consult on it, but I like I've told you, I don't I won't I won't do that unless I'm on a project ground up. So I'm not doing that. But uh I do think it has some pretty neat things about it. But overall, I think it's over-engineered at the price. And um the two hopper system, I don't know, it's just uh let's see. It's a shame that Onyx takes a large bit of eugenoides. Well, so we're the ones who first, like, the reason that we take a, lot, a large bit, it, I mean, we're taking, like, I don't know, percentage, like 10 or 20%. Um, but it's because we were the first one that invested really into the farm. Like, there was, I think, uh, Isaiah Sheese competed with the year before, but we were the first to ever win with eugenoides. We went hard on campaigning and marketing for them. Uh, they came up to visit us many times. And, all, and to be honest with you, they offered us to have all of the eugenoides. Um, and we declined. Um, so I guess it is what it is, but uh, there, there's more resources now for eugenoides coming out in the next few years uh, as other people's crops are growing. So yeah, um, anyway. Uh, so these fancy, super expensive coffees that are used in competition, is there hope of them becoming more affordable or does the process is used pretty impossible scale if we become cheaper? Well, I, I wouldn't even fantasize over those coffees. Honestly, it's kind of like, for me, it's kind of like if you're into bourbon, these fancy coffees are like if you were to take a bourbon and finish it in a sherry cask or if you put honey in it, right? It's like there you taste, you know, a bourbon that's been finished in a sherry cask. You're like, yeah, it's cool. I kind of want to just have the bourbon though, you know, uh, because it has so much more complexity on its own than this overwhelming taste of sherry. Um, 
Uh, let's see. In espresso competitions, do you all use the same machines? Yes, they have to. It's a sponsored machine. For the longest time, it was a Black Eagle, but it recently changed to the Storm. But yes. How many competitors use a WDT shaker or spray water on the grounds? No one. I, I've not ever seen anyone spray because that would be a mess and you would get counted off for tech. So that's what I'm saying is people aren't optimizing their extraction or anything like that because they don't have to because the coffees they use don't require anything like that. It can have a bad extraction, still taste passably, right? Um, and so WDT now is very, like, I think it's like 80% of competitors or something this year will be using the auto comb. Uh, so WDT is everywhere now. Uh, and it's because people were realizing that even though their coffees are easy to extract, the OCD is not nearly as good at distributing uh, for evenness of extraction. Uh, and so it's a bit more predictable with the OC, with the auto comb. And then you have, um, um, yeah, RDT, I don't see anyone do because it'd be a potential mess. I'm, I'm sure there have been some that have done it, but not anyone I've seen. And shakers, actually, the one that I know for sure did a shaker was in 2017, Andre Ehrman. He pulled about 20,000 shots in preparation for comp. And it wasn't just for comp he did that. He contributed a ton of shot pulls for uh, some scientists. Uh, in fact, Samo worked on one of the projects where a lot of the shots were pulled by Andre, who's a Swiss guy. And um, he, during his training where he pulled these 20,000 shots, he tried all different types of distribution methods, including WDT and different things. And what he said he ended up going on stage with was the blind shaker. So whenever my videos came out, he messaged me and said, yeah, I'm not surprised. In fact, I'm surprised no one's caught on to that earlier. He was like, I've pulled so many shots, and that's what I competed with. Um, he was also the first to roast on stage, which is kind of cool. He brought a little sample roaster on stage and roasted his coffee. Um, yeah, there are the nail kits, the nail kits, the which is the uh, scent training kits that you can use. Someone asked about scent training kits. You can do that, but that's just going to calibrate you with the Q exam, not necessarily the judges. Um yeah, I'll go one Brewer's Cup with the Pro Brew Pietro. There's a lot of competitors using the Pro Brew Pietro, which is really neat. Um, let's see. So I haven't consulted on anything with San Ramo. Someone said, what else have you consulted on with San Ramo? I have not consulted on anything. They asked if I would on the X1, and I kindly declined. Um, have you tried Oreo before? No, I have not. Do I see a comeback for washed coffee? No, I do not. Um, they don't want to push too much extraction, make sure their notes pop even more and are not muted by taste of the coffee itself. <laughs> would you, would I ever judge at a brewer's cup? No, I would not. Um, I would not judge because like I said, I'm not really a big fan of the competitions in general. Um, you know, I just, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I, if I could control who won <laughs> or not, not who won, if I could control that the winner was going to be an ambassador, especially coffee to the world, then maybe I would, I would judge. But right now with how things are run with what seems to be kind of a money grabbing operation, it's a little bit disheartening. Um, I help, I've helped, like I said, I helped Harris or, and I help Harris because he runs my discord and I appreciate his help. Um, and I've helped Morgan because I think Morgan was someone that could have been a really great specialty um, ambassador. And I still think so. She's competing again this year. Uh, but outside of that, I don't really have interest in doing any judging or anything. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, we've done, uh, almost an hour, so I'm probably going to log off. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, it was a good time. The coffee is now cold, but, uh, that's how they judge it in Brewer's Cup, right? They got to wait till it's cold for their final note calls. But anyway, uh, I appreciate you coming around and for having a little, uh, jam sesh with me. I'll see you all in discord to those of you in the Patreon. Uh, other than that, to anyone else watching, Check out my Patreon if you want to join some of these live Q&As. We also do a lot of the competition giveaways. Someone just won a fellow opus as of this video. And we'll be putting up more grinders and espresso machines and all the goods soon. I just filmed a video on all those grinders that you see in the background. Um, and they'll be they'll be given away as well. Um, so I think that's about it. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that you brew something tasty today. And cheers.